What's going on, my boys? Welcome back to another episode of the Think Face Podcast. I'm YT Dan, your host, the legendary duelist. We're going to be getting in there to talk about a lot of different things today, but specifically, we're going to be talking about the journey back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, if you haven't noticed recently on this channel, I've been doing a lot of upkeep and changes. I've been making more content. I've been making new content. I've been doing um, lots of different streams in the vertical, and I'm trying out a lot of different stuff on this YouTube platform. There's a lot of things you can do on this platform, but in terms of Yu-Gi-Oh! and content creation, um, I feel that there is pretty much a very narrow window in which you can do do these things so i'm looking to expand that window a little further but my boys in this podcast episode we're going to talk about the journey of coming back to Yu-Gi-Oh! and for me personally coming back to Yu-Gi-Oh! also means a lot of things because um over time the definition in Yu-Gi-Oh! um that has changed for me. The definition of why I'm playing this game and also uh, the game has changed over time. And it's changed so much that I, this is the reason why we're talking and this is the reason why you're here. So let's lock in right now, my boy. So pretty much my personal reintroduction to the game was back when I joined Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. I decided to step away from the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, I would say pretty much at the end of the Gladiator Beast era. Um, I guess that's around like 2008-ish, 2009-ish. And um, at the end of that spot, I pretty much just went into a professional uh, career. I just kind of started to focus on that more heavily. And to be very frank, um, until I got older, until right now, um, I realized that... Um, you know, the way I used to lock in on Yu-Gi-Oh um, definitely was like a trauma response. Um, the way that I lived my life uh, when I was growing up back in the city of Detroit was, um, you know, like anyone who grew up in the ghetto. <laughs> it was not it was not a, um, a fun and advantageous uh, experience for me. Um, you know, some people get through those times and experiences uh, fairly easily. But for me, um, it, it, it took some growing. And by the time I got old enough to ride the bus by myself and play children's card games, that's pretty much when um, I was able to kind of shake free from that cycle, escape the hood through Yu-Gi-Oh! And then um, due to the found family that I had actually grow and expand my knowledge as um, a person. And, and from there, I kind of just evolved. But, you know, that's more of like a, a second story that we'll definitely go into for another podcast topic. That's a whole nother podcast topic um, about how Yu-Gi-Oh helped to raise me up out of my circumstance um, when I had nothing. And before I made money in Yu-Gi-Oh, before Yu-Gi-Oh brought me any type of fame or acknowledgement, or I sold a card or won a tournament, Yu-Gi-Oh brought me um, self-confidence. Yu-Gi-Oh taught me how to love myself. And that's something you can't get through anything else. Anime does not teach you to love yourself. Anime might teach you friends are there along the way and journeys and all this other stuff. But Yu-Gi-Oh! is a trading card game that taught me to love myself, taught me that I actually had what it takes to be cunning, clever, and one step ahead of my opponent. And I took that and applied that to my life. So that was pretty much my whole thing about Yu-Gi-Oh! Like back when I first rediscovered it with Duel Links, I could feel these powers just bubbling up inside of me. You know, I felt at the time when I put Yu-Gi-Oh! away, um, and I thought that I wasn't going to be playing it anymore. Um, I really thought that um, I had outgrew it and, and all the lessons that I needed to learn had been learned and there was nothing else more that I could get. But definitely, I learned a lot through Duel Links. I learned a lot through the community. I learned a lot through YouTube. And to just shout that out really quick, the whole advent of social media, YouTube, um, and Discord and, and the like is just such a insane thing that was new and now it kind of feels so prevalent it just feels like it's always been but before there was these online systems that kept us all connected globally there was just these small niche 
um, pods of people that helped us get locked in. And we kind of don't have that um, unless it's just some sort of digital representation of that. But, you know, from playing Duel Links, um, that really inspired me to continue this game. You know, the Gladiator Beast was my absolute favorite deck of all time. Still my favorite deck of all time to this day. I'm still rocking with the Gladiator Beast. But when I discovered the Hazy Flame for the first time, when I finally found the Hazy Flame for the first time, I had that uh, serendipitous feeling like almost like we had known each other. But that was a, just a funny little uh, emotional thing about Yu-Gi-Oh! And that's just something that I think a lot of people experience too. It's just the general emotion behind these cards that keeps them tied in. So, you know, my boy... You know, I just wanted to kind of just give that little bit of premise to set us up here because pretty much in this entire uh, podcast, we're just going to go through um, a, a bunch of different topics from that standpoint. So first, we're going to talk about like the current state of Yu-Gi-Oh! We're going to talk about deck building in the modern era. We're going to talk about strategies for success. We're going to talk about um, more on the social media side of gaming or social media side of Yu-Gi-Oh! So, so to speak. And then we're going to also talk about overcoming the most uh, daunting challenges in terms of Yu-Gi-Oh! And then after at the end of all that, you know, we'll just wrap it up and then just have like a final uh, discussion about everything. But right now, I feel like the current state of Yu-Gi-Oh! is an, in a perfect position for someone to rejoin no matter where they're stepping in you know just to be very frank no matter where you step in returning to Yu-Gi-Oh it's gonna be like sipping from a fire hose I created an AI and also a book that can help bring you back to the competitive stage of the game you know primarily when you're learning Yu-Gi-Oh there is two different worlds. There is the casual world and then there is the competitive world. And it doesn't matter if you go to uh, tournaments and you go to locals um, until you start to think like a competitive player, you are not a competitive player. So I created a book and I created an AI to help hone your skills in game theory and also help to hone your skills in the mechanics of the game at a high level so you can learn how to utilize the three effect rule, one card combos, and, and many, many other things. And I wrote the book because there is, isn't anything to help bridge the gap for someone who left the game and someone who is returning to the game. Um, that's one of those things I've been doing since... I've been unemployed for a whole year. Well, basically almost two years now. Um, and I wrote this book and I created this AI because I felt like these are the tools that can help bring people to the game. Um, and I and this has been a passion project that's been in the back of my mind forever. And I finally brought it to fruition. So the reason why I wanted to bring that up is we just had a ban list here in, um, I believe it was uh, September or, or end of August. And pretty much this ban list not only got rid of Apalooza Boa, the goddess, but in the previous ban list, we lost many of the prominent negates and many of the prominent um, problematic cards. Now, one thing that um, we are not ever going to get away from i feel like that's going to be a continuous thing forever is the one card combo i feel like unless we go to some sort of zero card combo or or 0.5 card combo unless we go to something like that um you know that's 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 the only thing you can do beyond a one card combo um but right now the one card combo is just how the game is played at a competitive level if your card isn't or if, or if the card that you're playing um isn't answering multiple cards or um doesn't have extreme value off the resol re resolution of a single card then you're kind of always going to be behind the eight ball you know i talked about um in a few of my videos on my channel here uh, especially when i talk about hyper geometric distribution and things like that you know that's specifically um a statistical theory that will isolate and identify key cards and those key cards are those one card combo starter cards that can get you going no matter what i mean the name of the game in Yu-Gi-Oh is to activate these one card starters and to set up and establish a board or 
activate your one card starter to dismantle an opponent's board and either create a game state in which your opponent cannot recover or to take their life points down to zero. This is the current state of Yu-Gi-Oh. Back when I left um, or stopped playing Yu-Gi-Oh around 2008, the game wasn't nearly as fast in this regard. But I would say that domination um, and also um, tempo in terms of like a winning tempo could definitely be established by the second turn. So by the time we get to 2024, we've just sped that up to instead of establishing tempo, we just win on the third turn. So one of the things that really helped me to understand this game from the beginning is understanding this shift from where things were back in 2008 up to where things now in 2024. And the number one thing that I just want to kind of hone in that really helped me to get my mind around this concept is that a duel only lasts three turns. Really the turn player goes first. And if the turn player is successful in creating a board that is um, prohibiting to the opponent then the turn two player will not be able to establish gameplay and if they can't establish gameplay they typically lose by turn three you know this is pretty much like the turn zero philosophy i cover in the book which is pretty much setting up and establishing the board um you know before your opponent or having the the tools and capability to counter a fully established board no matter what the power level is you know um this is just primarily one of the things that i did uh go go over in the book that i mentioned um you know sanzu's quote the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting so that's why on the first turn if we can establish a board full of cards that say negate and destroy or banish or put face down then we can establish a board where in which we do not have to actually do battle we, we never have to touch our opponent's life points and we can actually win the duel now because that is the case and you know everything has been dramatically sped up you know we have um this split I would say in the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game world, everyone doesn't have to come back to the physical game. Now the physical game has its own rules. I would say right now the physical game would be considered to be like elite status. I would say the physical game would be like, um, definitely the top tier, highest prestige, highest, um, esteem in terms of um clout and also like Yu-Gi-Oh playing prowess you know you have a side deck it's best two out of three and these are live in-person events but in 2002 uh 2022 uh Master Duel was released and when Master Duel came out that changed the game forever because Master Duel for the first time um was an official Yu-Gi-Oh TCG client that pretty much anyone could pick up and get all the cards and it was really close to the modern tcg and ocg so because it's close enough and um <laughs> it's only one game and the the whole dynamic uh is kind of closer to the ocg with maxi um it is a completely different meta game so that being said since it's a different meta game you kind of have to make a choice you know do you want to go master duel or do you want to go to the tcg and personally i feel like master duel is the best bet for anyone just coming back to the game because master duel not only has a ton of features that can help you play the game you can probably get on board for free and after you learn what you need to learn from reading the book or listening to it for free or playing or getting experience or however you learn Yu-Gi-Oh again, when you jump onto these starter decks, you'll instantly understand where the weaknesses of these decks are and why certain cards shouldn't be in this deck because you'll see that these cards don't serve the deck's win condition Um you know to your liking because you'll have an advanced knowledge um and understanding and also in master duel it just makes it easy to kind of hop on something and try it real quick and then move on to something else there are other simulators where you can do that but you know master duel is the official one and i think that because if 
if you're going to pretty much practice for any particular format and you want to kind of lock in with something, I guess, long term and actually compete in some uh, mainstream matches, uh, Master Duel does have its own circuit. I would say definitely Master Duel will be the ticket for that. But um, coming back to the game, you know, again, what are your resources? Number one. It's going to your number one resource is going to be the motivation to get back into this game. You know, if you have motivation to get back into the game, number one, you're going to have to find out when you left <laughs> and, um, when, and, and, you know, whenever you're coming back, what is the gap between that? You know, in the book, I do talk about different timelines from way back in the beginning of the days all the way up until 2023 or yeah, 2023, um, because obviously we wouldn't have 2024 stuff in there. But um, at this stage, I would say guidebooks. I use the AI that can really help you at this stage. I didn't have the AI being able to ask it ruling questions, being able to ask it specific questions on how certain cards work. It's like having a, like a judge in your pocket. It's just a really, really easy tool to have. Then you've got all types of online clients and databases that has a myriad of decks. YouTube is a great resource. All these things can help you get back into the game. But the most important thing at this stage is to number one, pick a lane. Are you going to be physical or are you going to be on um, the the digital client and if you're going to be on the digital client then that means you're going to be doing one-off sudden death matches which i think is preferable in the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game just based off of um the whole schema of Yu-Gi-Oh just kind of based off what Yu-Gi-Oh was and is it was all about just one match and then that's it you know so i i love that in master duel um now building a deck in the modern era definitely has changed i remember back in the day um you know you used to be able to just like grab a deck and then just throw some jank in there and then make it work but then as um archetypes were released and uh tournaments um were won and and then uh tiers were established uh, you know more powerful decks and combos became more uh widely known and widespread and before you know it um you know everything has changed in terms of modern deck building so you know what are you looking for in a modern deck versus your old deck i mentioned like we the gladiator beast deck back in 2008 and i ex, ex outside of cards like um test panther or uh, not test panther test tiger um you know there weren't really a lot or, or sector there weren't really a lot of cards that did um that I, like did a lot and if there was something that did a lot you know you'd have to have um a decent amount of setup uh to get that started but nowadays you know the game has pretty much segmented itself into these three things starters extenders and combo lines and i cover this in chapter three of the book we pretty much just go into why these three things are so important and the reason why i put them in these in that specific order is because that is the uh, order of their importance your starters which is pri is the primary card that's going to get you to any combo line is going to get you from point a to point z your extenders is just in case your opponent had a response to that starter you can use the extender to continue the play or sometimes a, an extender is like a card that says like this card can be special summit if you have the the starter on the field or or the archetype bull card on the field or something like that and either way these cards get you into your combo line now as you come into the duel you already have a mindset of kind of what you want to do you know you have a win condition and you're trying to um, execute on that win condition um, based on the deck that you built but the deck that you built primarily is going to be focused around the starters now take for example the snake eye deck obviously you know you're using the snake eye ash uh deck you know currently um that's one of the most powerful decks that was around um recently it got um banned or or necessarily uh it got uh limited and some of the cards were restricted and because those cards were restricted and and pretty much put on the outs um 
now it's been regulated down to just a single combo line. So um, that whole deck has been changed into a combo line and you can run it as an engine inside of your deck. Now, the reason why they did that is because the combo line that the Snake Eye Ash produces is so strong that extenders are not really necessary because you can always find a way to get in to um the snake eye ash you know and and that's primarily what all these other cards um serve the served uh their purpose each card either searched out snake eye ash um add a snake eye ash to the hand or whatever what have you so you can get the snake eye ash in play and uh because of that you know modern gameplay as i mentioned to you before is taken ratched up to that next level where games are pretty much decided by that third turn or pretty much the game is decided um on whoever sets up an established tempo and holds and holds it for at least a turn um so that's pretty much the whole idea you know between like you know what you're gonna be looking at now versus then you know primarily you know it's all about the one card combo execution how do you interact with the one card combo how does the one card combo affect you you know as the line is being completed you know does it have side effects is it banishing cards is it sending cards off top of your deck is it taking cards from your hand you know it's it's a lot of things that these lines do so not only understanding the starter but understanding the line is important and critical in this um understanding like the evolution of decks and how they've changed over time um one of the uh other um big things i, I would just like to talk about really quick is going second you know a, a deck building in the modern era um i would say like going first has always been great you know you could always set your bombless or floodgate you can you can set your trap holes you, you know you could do whatever you needed to do but you know going second has not been the best for a long time and we recently got new decks like tempai dragon um and in master duel we recently got the ancient gear archetype and then there's um also for example my archetype that i brought back from the dust the gladiator beast which is also a go second deck um you know primarily the reason why these go second decks can work at all is because they do have powerful cards that are blanket um negates or they ignore the opponent's cards you know sangin summoning allows um for your for you to set your combos up by shutting your opponent out um same thing with um the uh ancient gear fortress um and then of course um for the gladiator beast you know all i need to do is just get a single attack off but in order for me to do that attack i'm gonna have to uh, complete an elaborate line that will either a force you to interact or b um get rid of all your stuff so you know it's it's like every uh archetype has its advantage but most archetypes are focused on going first you know according to the ai uh when i ran the numbers 75 percent of players choose to go first and if 75 percent of players choose to go first that means that if you're really unlucky, you know, you're going to get to choose 25% of the time. So that 25% of the time, are you going to be crying and saying, finally, I got to go first? Or are you just going to be like, well, I guess I choose second. You know, that way, if you always choose second and your opponent forces you to take second, that means you get 100% of um, the matches are always starting, quote unquote, in your favor then you can measure your skill against um each player and the meta and everything like that but at the end of your uh 10 games you can see i had 10 games where i went second and i was able to win eight games that means that i'm really good at going second this deck is also good and viable and also i'm streaking really hard so i should continue all you just did was prove to yourself that you could um, create this solution and then not only uh, follow through going second, but you could find the little niches and nuances um, to pretty much capitalize on the uh, 
advantage of the knowledge that you receive by going second because your opponent has to play out all their cards and if they have no cards in hand it's a dead giveaway there's no hand traps etc so there's like lots of knowledge and information that you're dealing with going second like going second i think is a bigger challenge than going first because it's more like a dual quiz where you're trying to solve for game you know you're literally as they say back in algebra back in the day you're trying to solve for x you're solving for g right now you're solving for game and i love solving for game so i just want to put that little feather in your cap and just throw that out there because in in the whole concept of modern deck building the evolution of um these different decks i would definitely say that's something that a lot of people kind of leave on the back burner and even myself i love it on the back burner but i'm bringing it to the forefront right now my boy because i think it's definitely um you know on the rise as these new cards come out and then we've got these new um hand traps coming out it's going to be absolutely crazy with dominus purge and um there's another card that I, um, the mole charmies um so there's, there's just a lot of stuff uh, happening uh <laughs> and i feel like you know going second definitely um is good um now here's like another thing i want to just get into since we already really talked about going first and going second and all that is the perfect segment of the strategies for success like i think these strategies could definitely help you because if you're choosing to go go second for example you know you're only choosing to go second because you have a really strong knowledge of what the meta game is you understand the meta and you could probably explain to someone you know um how to analyze or adapt to a certain meta game like you're playing against um uh the snake eye deck and you realize against the snake eye deck i should just play more hand traps because that way i'll have a better chance at negating the snake eye ash leaving my opponent open and since they utilize their entire hand just to combo off to summon the snake eye ash it's a key it's a strong likelihood that going second that my opponent will be depowered and if they're depowered i should be able to overcome them um with my one card combo whatever that is so i'm saying you know going second you have to make these types of assessments you know going first you're just saying well i completed my combo i went first i should win game <laughs> and, and and that's a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players perception and there's nothing wrong with that perception um but there is a problem with that perception and the only problem with that is is that you are just thinking that you're guaranteed to dub but unfortunately you only just opened yourself up like going first is one of the most vulnerable positions because not only do you reveal what you're on but you also reveal how many resources you're going to have available in the next turn and i know you're going to draw a card and I've, I've read all the cards on the field i know how to navigate your board to make sure you don't get anything back so um you know, it's just it's just a very uh, unique position to go uh, second. So I think, you know, understanding the meta is definitely something that you need to do, um, regardless of going first or second. Um, and, and learning about the different uh, combo lines and the different synergies between um, their the cards in the lines, as I mentioned before, about making sure that you understand if these lines um, have an effect um as they're being completed if these lines actually will um banish uh destroy put on the put face down flip flip uh put at the bottom of the deck whatever the case may be you know you need to make sure you understand that in the completion of these lines there are going to be some effects um for example uh, flame burst dragon as you're completing the line um going second flame burst dragon is going to be able to put some any monster in the spell and trap zone as you're completing the snake eye combo line so basically you can count on one card being removed from the field um and not being destroyed or banished because if the snake eye uh ash resolves you're gonna see that flame burst dragon that's how tight these combos are these days and how powerful the um the lines are these days so there really isn't a lot of room for error you know Yu-Gi-Oh is a game that really rewards perfect gameplay and then um if you punish someone you know Yu-Gi-Oh will reward you for punishing someone who made a mistake that's just kind of the game how the game is designed um and um 
I think also one of the things that you should always try your best to do, especially if you're playing math or duel, continue to practice and keep an eye out for your specific deck and archetype you need to always be searching it like i always search gladiator beast to see if anyone else has come up with some new tech i'm looking on the websites i'm checking things out and you know there's always new stuff here and there um but if you are running like a niche deck you know it might be hard to find stuff so that's why i use the ai to help bridge that gap to help find things on the internet <laughs> especially um um, when my thing, when the things that I use are uh, niche, um, and then of course uh, you have all the uh, different simulators that are out there uh, where you can get a lot of practice in um, and get a lot of uh, continued learning from there. But I would point out to in Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, you can go into solo mode and, and go to the digital bug nest. Uh, if you go down, go to those AI duels, the last two duels is really good for going first and really good for going second. Uh, if you want to get some practice in, you know, going first, uh, they set up a board with a couple of responses, which is pretty cool. Um, and going second, uh, they actually will uh, use hand traps. <laughs> so, so that's uh, actually pretty cool, or vice versa. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. And I think definitely, if you want to just at least play against the imperm and the maxi and see if your your deck can play through imperm and maxi, definitely check out Digital Bug Nest and get some practice in because you got to remember it's not practice that makes perfect it's perfect practice that makes perfect if you are doing it correctly or you're or you're figuring out or you're learning in a productive manner that uh perfect practice is gonna you know make you a perfect duelist but you know you got to make sure that it, you're putting in some quality work so make sure you try the digital bug nest because it's going to give you a realistic expectation for ranked because they always have maxi and imperm <laughs> and um the social side of Yu-Gi-Oh, i definitely would say we have an abundance of that i always like to think about Yu-Gi-Oh players as um honestly a bit a bit like vagabonds you know we are traveling from platform to platform car shop to car shop you know setting up um a little tent for our communities uh of car games and um what i think is cool about that is that number one we always find each other what i think is kind of whack about that is a lot of the spaces we occupy um are swarmed with others and when they come in you know it's not the uh best situation and um you know on youtube for example you know you have tons of other things going on millions and billions of other videos and things going on so this isn't like a Yu-Gi-Oh centric portal or anything so you know Yu-Gi-Oh compared to everything else on this website is kind of nil so that's why i need your support Go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe for more Think Phase content all the time. Now, back to the content. <laughs> See, I like I did that <laughs> ad read for myself. But the, re <laughs> but the reality is, like, I really feel like the, the online community is really good if you can find a close-knit circle uh of people that you like to hang out with and play Yu-Gi-Oh with in person that is golden that's the best um and then of course if you chose to go TCG route you're going to need those guys anyway to go to the stuff like YCSs and um all those other things so uh definitely I would say uh from a social media standpoint you know we're, we're, we're pretty up pretty much up there like just like the tools like the tools and social media just wasn't a thing back when i first started um so yeah this is pretty much just a, a wonderful time to be a duelist and then i would say the overall um you know coming back into Yu-Gi-Oh, you know if i was to say what are the three things that w might be the hardest for anyone you know now that we've discussed the game and things like that you know everybody talks about Yu-Gi-Oh, loves talking shop and so do i but um overcoming these different challenges can be pretty tough but you know there's just i would say there's about three things that you could kind of look at and i would say number one is the learning curve um and then number two i would say is staying updated and number three um trying to avoid being overwhelmed now avoiding 
over avoiding being overwhelmed and also uh the learning curve kind of goes hand in hand <laughs> i will tell you honestly for a long time i didn't play nibiru because i just felt that when i was learning how to play in person nibiru was a card that just made me feel stupid <laughs> because i would either either i would play it too late or 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 it would be played around and then i just would feel dumb like you know so i just decided to not play nibiru and decided to play other hand traps instead of nibiru so that i could number one avoid being overwhelmed and number two i could continue to play and 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 get a little bit better as i continued uh to play in these more competitive settings but definitely uh nibiru was a challenge for me in the beginning for some reason i don't even know why um but you know you know it could be you know let me know what a challenge was for you uh in the comments if you've ever had a challenge like that just been a certain card that just didn't jive with you until one day it did all right and then i would definitely say staying updated um it's pretty much easy at this standpoint with ai with um uh all these online clients all these tools youtube uh x all this different stuff you can do to uh stay updated so the only way you can only way you're not updated in Yu-Gi-Oh is if you try not to be updated but um definitely i i, I think that um uh for sure you know when it comes to staying updated i would say uh, we're more than uh, we have more than enough to do that in the Yu-Gi-Oh space, my boy. But at the end of the day, you know, if you would ask me, you know, YT Dan, is this the time to uh, return to Yu-Gi-Oh? Is this the time to get back in there for game? I would say yes for many reasons, especially for Master Duel. But specifically in the TCG, um, we have prices going down in terms of singles because the 10 is coming out i think or it has already come out and then there's like um a blue eyes structure deck on the way that's supposed to be really good um and there's just a lot of other things that are in Yu-Gi-Oh that you have missed out on um since whenever the last time it was that you played but my boys um i think this is um a good uh position to leave it I really feel like uh, this is a great uh, time to just be a duelist. This is a great time to get in there and play Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, and, and if you really want to learn, get better at the game, and then also have fun while doing it, you can check out my book, Revival of the Duelist. You can use my AI for free, um, which is um, at the Duelist AI at, on the GPT store um, in, uh, on ChatGPT. And uh, yeah, my boys, just check me out. Check out the rest of the content. And as always, keep it dang.